Hello and welcome. Welcome and hello to another, I don't know, I still don't have a name for this, but Noob Review, I guess. Logician Tim Noob Review. That sounds good to me. Good. Awesome. Well, let me change this over. We're back <coughs> with some more tales from the loop. And what we're going to be going over tonight is the um, uh, is the world that tales from, tales from the loop takes place in. And on Monday, I gave you my first impressions and I was really excited about it. And tonight, I'm going to be telling you more about the world and the game. But first, um, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to take you back into the 1980s and ask you some questions. And if you're in here live, that's great. If um, if you're seeing this on the on the replay, awesome. Let me turn this down. I always forget to turn my phone down, and then I always regret it. All right. So. There we go. All right. So what I'm going to do is take you back to the 1980s by asking you a few questions here. And you can answer them here. You can just answer them to yourself or or whatever. But let's let's go back to 1980s. I was born in 1975. So I would have been, you know, five to 15 years old. So uh, my my youth that I really remember uh, being young, young is um, is from is from 1980s. And that's pretty awesome. So it was a great time. What's up, Joe? So let me ask you a few things. Do you remember the hit songs from the 1980s? And I had to look up some of these, but Michael Jackson was huge. Madonna was huge. That blew up in pop culture. But then also like a lot of the metal bands, uh, such as Metallica, Megadeth, uh, Iron Maiden, Slayer, all of those came out in the 1980s. And so it got me thinking back, like what other awesome music came out in 1980s? Um, I mean, some, some awesome stuff, right? And then the movies that were going on at the time, E.T. was out, War Games, The Goonies, Top Gun, Return of the Jedi, uh, Back to the Future, Stand By Me, Stephen King book is awesome, Gremlins, uh, The Karate Kid, The Breakfast Club, tons and tons of these awesome movies were out in the, in the 1980s as well. So, uh, I mean, I just, it blows my mind when I start thinking about the 1980s and I was thinking, well, no, it's probably too long ago. I won't remember much, but there was some really awesome stuff that came out of that decade. Um, the Commodore 64, anybody have one of those? I did not have one of those, but that was uh, apparently the most popular computer of the decade was the uh, Commodore 64. And then they had, um, do you remember VCRs, right? Do you remember when those came out? You know, all of a sudden you could watch movies that were that were never available to you before, right? So uh, if you went to the movie theater and you try to get into an R-rated theater and, you know, do you have ID? Are you 18? No, I can't get in. Well, now when VCRs came out, all of a sudden you could watch any movie that you wanted pretty much as long as you had access to it. And I remember spending the night at my friend's house and uh, and watching horror movies all night long, like The Shining or uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Um, what was the one with Chucky with the little doll Chucky? Was it just Chucky? Uh, I remember watching that Hellraiser, Hellraiser, The Evil Dead, all these awesome movies, spending the night in my friend's house on VCR, and because of this awesome miracle of the 1980s. So, um, what else was in the 80s? The Cold War, right? Um, did do you guys remember the um, doing drills in school? I remember this as a young kid and being kind of scared. You get un underneath your desk and you know, kind of do your head between your between your legs and uh, between your knees. The duck and cover, I think, is what it was called. The duck and cover. And I mean, the the bomb, the the threat of nuclear war, atomic war with with Soviet Union was it was real and it scared the shit out of me. I'll just be honest with you. Um, it was a it was a crazy time. And uh, so I, I remember the 80s quite well. And this is maybe this is why this book uh, just speaks so much to me and maybe to others, too, is because a lot of people grew up in this era and remember these these fantastic times from the you know very political 70s with, um, you know, Watergate and uh, all that kind of things to to Reagan taking office in the 80s. And we're trying to rebuild trust back into the government. Uh, so, I mean, just all types of, of cool things were going on. Uh, so the eighties were, was an awesome, awesome decade. And, um, you know, overall it was, it was pretty awesome from what I remember. Right. Um, 
Joe says, let's not forget the most iconic movie of the 80s, Back to the Future. Yes. Yes. Huey Lewis in the news. Yes. I need it. Was it? I need a new drug. Yeah. That was awesome, man. Back to the Future, 1985 was the was the date they put on there. I don't know if that's the, was that the year it came out? I guess it was. And uh, so that was, I just remember that being the year inside the DeLorean that, that he had to travel back to. So, uh, so yeah, the 80s was awesome. And uh, th- this, this book, The Tales from the Loop, takes you right back into the 80s, but it has, it kind of alters the history just a little bit. It's like the 80s plus. And they call it that it's the 80s that never was. So uh, things are just not, you know, a lot of things are the same, but uh, things are not quite the same as you remember them. So it begs the question, you know, what's different? So let us let me open up the book here. And uh, this this is just on chapter two, okay? This is where this super deep stuff comes in chapter two. And chapter one is what I went over with the first impressions for the most part last week with the awesome art and stuff. And then chapter two just takes you right into the 1980s and sucks you in. Okay. And it starts talking about the age of the loop. And so it kind of gives some backstory here and what's going on. (coughs) Sorry, I got a little cough. So Joe says, uh, back to the future was 1984. Holy smokes. Wow. That's a long time ago, but it doesn't seem like that long to me. So, uh, in the years after uh, world war II, all the major powers started investing, you know, massive amounts of time and energy uh, into experimental research programs. And uh, most of them didn't yield many results, but a few of them paid off big time. And one of those, and again, this is all in the book. This is like the altered version of of the 1980s here. One of those experiments that that paid off so big, so big was what's called the, the magnetrine it's magnetrine or magnetrine, M-A-G-N-E-T-R-I-N-E, magnetrine, magnetrine effect. Okay. And this is discovered in the Soviet Union and um, it gave rise to these, um, to this awesome technology that uh, allowed like these giant freighters and things to, uh, to be elevated off the ground using this kind of anti-gravity technology. And so, and it goes really deep into how this magnetrine effect works and they, they put these these uh, magnetrine devices on the on the bottom of these vehicles and allows them to lift you know a lot of weight and it uses the magnetic energy from uh, from the earth to allow it to work and so it's it's just a it's a really cool thing and the book goes really deep into it I don't have a lot of time to go into it tonight but the book goes way into it and so the science fiction part kind of takes over in me and uh, and and it, it kind of solves that it's it's great so anyway so this this magnetrine effect uses um, the the Earth's gravitation or not gravitational but magnetic um, field to lift these um, these f- giant freighters that some of them are 300 meters long that can lift 10,000 tons and they can float above the northern hemisphere they said because the southern hem- hemisphere it's the magnetic field is weaker and so it doesn't allow for these giant freighters and so these these freighters are, are commonplace in this in this type of world and, uh, uh, you know, they use this type of technology to float above the ground, they carry tons of weight. And um, so so it kind of gives you this background about war, after World War II about how all these governments are doing these experiments. And uh, the magnetrine effect is one of them that pays off. And now in the 1950s, the world's first uh, particle accelerator is built in Boulder City, Nevada. And it's part of a military program. And... Um, the scientific um, achievements weren't really made clear, but uh, just a few years later, uh, in the 1960s, Sweden built an even bigger one, and uh, they built it in a place called the Malaren Islands, which is just outside of Stockholm. Again, this is just in the book. Um, so scientists from all over the world apparently flocked to this largest particle accelerator uh, to to you know kind of play out and run their experiments. And the locals end up naming this particle accelerator the loop. And so that's where we get the term the the loop from. Okay, so it's giant particle, around particle accelerator into the ground. They call it the loop. Well, at the same time as this, uh, a company in Japan perfected what they called uh, the self-balancing machine in their laboratories. And so, and then uh, late, you know, 1970s and into the 80s, these machines, what most people now call robots, they become commonplace in industry 
and into defense forces. And so Japan kind of perfected these, these self-balancing machines they call robots. Um, so the kids, you know, in the, in the world, they might, they might see these giant, you know, mega freighters floating in the sky or these, these robots of varying sizes, you know, wandering around the earth. Yeah, Joe, just like CERN. So basically just like CERN, um, so these kids might see these giant mega uh, freighters flying overhead or these robots, you know, of all different sizes from, uh, from really small to very large. Uh, they would see us, uh, see them like we might see a helicopter flying or some big giant, you know, military aircraft uh, plane fly over. You know, it's really cool to see, but at the same time, it's not anything out of the ordinary. And so it doesn't, it's not anything that surprises the kids. It's things that they, they've seen before. They're aware that exist. Um, and they're just, they're just cool, but they're not out of place. And, um, so the book really breaks down, uh, the scenes in, or, or the locations in two different places, um, being able to take place either in, uh, in Sweden or in Boulder city, uh, Nevada. So what I'm going to do, and, and they break down each, the location of, of both places, very well and really suck you into either one that you choose to play in. I just, I went through the Swedish one just cause it was first and it had a lot of the, um, a lot of the material in it, uh, was, was just, well, both of them are easily broken down, but it just had it, uh, right there in front of me. So I just broke down the, the way that they, uh, they gave us the Swedish introduction to the world first. So the Swedish government and, and the politics in the 1980s, uh, some called it, you know, the, a socialist utopia, but others called it a, a failed experiment attempting to find, you know, a middle ground between, you know, capitalism and communism. And so back then, education and health care, uh, no problem, John. Back then, education and health care are, are provided by the, by the government in Sweden, and they believe that the government should care for their citizens from cradle to grave. Okay, so alcohol is only sold in state-owned stores. There's only two TV channels, both state owned, and they show a mix of U.S. soap operas, Swedish social realist dramas, and cartoons from behind you know, the Iron Curtain back in Soviet Union. Uh, officially, a Sweden is neutral and it is not aligned with NATO or the Warsaw Pact. They have good relations with the Soviet Union and the United States, but there's like an open secret with uh, the Swedish military and along with uh, some politicians and a lot of the residents in Sweden that they see actually see Soviet Union as an enemy. And that is that is um, reaffirmed in 1981 when a Soviet su submarine uh, runs aground and the threat kind of becomes real. So that's kind of how the Swedish government and politics were in the 80s. Now, in uh, Swedish society in the 80s, uh, yuppies were around, and they like to celebrate their UK or United States influences, capitalistic influences, by driving a Porsche and maybe, you know, carrying around those giant cell phone bricks. You remember those things? They're like, they're huge. Uh, so you saw that a lot in the 80s. You know, kids were often playing with, with garbage pail kids. I love garbage pail kids. Uh, they're playing with He-Man, the Transformers, all those things were popular. Uh, I told you before, most houses had a Commodore 64. Uh, this is what's really cool is uh, pen and paper games became very popular. And I'm going to mess up this name. They call it Dr Drakar Ok Demonir and another game called Mutant. Both of them uh, selling over, over 100,000 copies each. What's up, Jay? And so, uh, Drakar Ak Demonir, it almost sounds like Dungeons and Dragons or something of the sort, I'm assuming. Uh, but that was, uh, pen and paper games were very, uh, very popular. Now the seventies were a really political, uh, was a really political decade and the eighties, uh, were more individualistic. Okay. And, uh, so people taking vacations and those type of things, uh, more than ever before. So what was, uh, what was growing up like? in uh, in Sweden in the 80s. So a big part of the community sees, you know, parts of pop culture such as like the horror movies and computer games, the heavy metal, the pen and paper games to be like soul corrupting, like it's going to it's going to corrode the youth. It's going to corrupt the youth. Um and and so they they were really frowned upon by, you know, a lot of people in the government. It was on TV news all the time. Parents didn't know what to think about it. 
uh, you know, trading trading VH, VHS tapes with your friend, uh, with your friends at school is a big hobby. You know, allowing you to watch those hard to find U.S. made movies that everybody's talking about. Excuse me. And then also getting a copy of some pirated uh, cassettes. Yes, cassettes full of Commodore 64 games uh, would be like finding treasure for those that, that are into, into the Commodore 64 stuff. And so that was that was really big into the 80s in Sweden going up there. So uh, heavy metal bands are in synth, uh, synth pop are really big. Uh, and, and, you know, they're, they're kind of that dangerous kind of mix for, for those rebellious kids. Uh, teen magazines are being read and they're real popular with, you know, subjects such as glam, glam rock or computer games. Um, you know, comic books like uh, the Swedish version of Spider-Man, Phantom, uh, you know, they, they all captivate, captivate the imaginations uh, of these young people back in the 80s in Sweden. So not, not very much unlike the U.S., really, that I remember. So, and unlike, uh, not unlike the U.S., a divorce is get, becoming more and more common this time, and uh, kids are growing up in separate or broken households. And, um, you know, so the parents kind of let, they kind of back off and let the kids do whatever they want to do. And, you know, as long as you're home by dark, do you remember that? When the streetlights came on, you knew it was time to go home. Uh, we didn't have pagers or cell phones or GPS devices. When the, you know, you could be however long, however far distance away, but when the streetlights came on, you could be in the middle of a sentence, you broke out and ran to the house, right? And uh, at least that's how it was around my area. So, uh, but this turbulence at home with the parents, you know, divorcing and fighting and the uncertainty of the Cold War at the time kind of made life as a kid, you know, wonder kind of what happened to the the so-called, you know, safe life of our family, you know, our family and our world. Just everything is a little bit more dangerous in the 80s. And maybe maybe that's just because I was a kid, but that's the way it seemed like a lot of people felt back then. Um. So also, you know, constant homework, and it kind of says this in the book, it talks about the constant homework, uh, people playing social games at school, demands from parents and siblings, uh, you know, are super high as always, you know, bullies mess with you and you find out that, that some friends really aren't friends at all. This is just normal childhood stuff. And this all happened in Sweden as well in the eighties. So the book kind of talks about this and it, it gives you all this information to suck you right back into the 1980s. And it gives you uh, some of the, the popular things that you would do back in the 1980s as a kid. And one of them was, you know, hanging out at the local kiosk, what they call the kiosk. And what they said, what these are, are small, like newspaper stands, uh, like you might see in New York City is the way I kind of imagine it, is that would sell, you know, magazines or candy, tobacco, some of them would sell hamburgers and hot dogs, those, those type of things. And that's where a lot of the kids would just kind of gather up and, and, and meet and hang out there. And it said that, you know, a lot of the, the workers there, they were, they were usually grumpy. They're suspicious of the kids, you know, um, hanging out there without buying anything. So the kids would often kind of buy, you know, one or two little things so that, just so that they could hang out there without being hassled by the, the, by the worker there. Now, and it also made this this cool point because I can kind of remember doing this as a kid. It says whenever a kid comes into some cash, the kiosk becomes one of the first places they think to visit. And I remember doing that. Do you remember getting, you know, your mom gives you a dollar for cutting the grass or, you know, your grandmother gives you a, a check for five dollars for your birthday. And I remember going up to the convenience store and just thinking, like, I'm rich, you know, I'm rich and I could buy um you know, I buy a Coke, I buy my buddy a Coke, I buy candy bars and, you know, maybe some gum. And, and I was into baseball cards back then. I buy a couple of packs of baseball cards with me and my friends, but I felt rich back then. So Joe says, uh, they call them news agents in the UK. Okay. That's what a uh, kiosk is. It's a news agent in the UK. Gotcha. So yeah, I mean, that's just one of the things that you would do in the eighties. Another thing that says is, is was popular was that kids would go to a school dance. They called it a disco. Now, uh, I don't know how many dances you went to in um, in you know middle school or elementary school. It wasn't a whole lot of them. Hey, Misty. But uh, the dances I went to were super lame. That kind of that's kind of how they describe it in Tales from the Loop as well. You know, there's no alcohol involved. Um, you know, just lemonade and, and some popcorn, maybe some fruit punch or something like that. And everybody's just kind of off to the side. You know, eating their popcorn. And drinking their drink and not really, uh, not really dancing much, and 
until nobody danced until that gratuitous slow song came on right and then it was like oh it's it's time to ask somebody to dance finally and you've got your eye on some girl or some girl's got her eyes on you and you know it even gives a couple examples here of some songs and it cracks me up uh you know the gratuitous slow slow dance playing carrie by europe or winds of change by the scorpions you remember winds of change Oh my, I can like, I can hear it right now. I can hear winds of change. I'm not going to sing it for you. Um, I'll save you that. But you know, that song comes on and finally you're like, okay, I, I've been waiting all night. I'll ask Sarah to dance or whatever. And so you'll go over there and you'll grab them, you know, you're by the hip and, and you're just kind of you know, stepping back and forth, trying not to step on each other's toes. And that's, that's how dances were back then. And I'm just trying to help bring you, bring you back to that. Jay, uh, Jay says, we used to hang out at 7-Eleven playing arcade games and drinking Slurpees. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, for sure. That's the place to be. So, uh, so yeah, th that was funny that they mentioned a school dance because I haven't thought about a school dance in forever. And uh, that just the way that this book helped bring back the memories of how school dances were, it really just sucks me right back into the 80s. What's up, Scott? And uh, so another thing it, it said that was popular in the 80s uh, in Sweden, again, as well as, as in the U.S., is uh, computer and analog games. Both are very popular. The Commodore 64, later on the Atari ST, the Amiga, uh, all those start to make their appearances back in the 1980s. And, um, you know, it talks about it's common to go to a friend's house after school and just literally stay there all day afternoon until it gets dark and play computer games or pen and people pen and paper games until it gets dark and then you knew it's time to go home and uh, um, but it talks about how the pen and paper role-playing games are sold in huge numbers in Sweden and they have or have or had uh, at least it says it had uh, the highest number of RPG players per capita anywhere in the world and I didn't know that so that, that's pretty interesting and the the RPG games gave kids a way to to channel this creativity and imagination creating you know new new homebrew games and drawing complicated maps and writing adventures for their friends and they could do this while uh, while at school instead of doing their homework or in study hall or whatever and they could sit there and um, and create these these pen and paper games these worlds for their friends to enjoy later on and I thought, man, that, that just, it really takes me back. I didn't play RPGs as a, as a kid, but I remember some of my friends must have played them because they were sitting there drawing maps and they were drawing, you know, um, all types of awesome, you know, fantasy stuff that I, I didn't know what the heck it was. I just remember thinking, how cool is that picture that they're drawing? And uh, so, yeah, I used to watch that all the time. And uh, so another thing that was popular was, kids like to watch watch the videos you know vhs movies and uh, the video stores were popular back then i don't know if you remember this but most families couldn't afford a vhs player and what that they had this this thing called a movie box i don't know if you remember this it was a a vhs player in a, like this really heavy duty plastic you know, like a plastic box like a plastic encase uh, vhs player and you could rent it and uh, for like a week at a time and if you had one of those, you were you were the most popular kid around. Everybody was coming over, and you tried to, to watch all the movies before you had to return them by, at 6 p.m. And and uh, before you had to return your movie box back for the week, you'd just sit there and veg out and watch all the movies you possibly could. And uh, so, let's see, where was I? So, yeah, I talked about that. You know, there was a big debate, and I think you'll probably remember this, about violence in movies and especially with the access that kids had then with VHS movies and uh, watching Hellraiser. Did anybody remember what the Chucky movie was with the doll? I can't remember the name of it. Was it just Chucky? I, I can't remember. But I just remember watching Chucky over and over again at my friend's house because he had it on VHS. And every time I'd spend the night, we'd watch that. And it was awesome. But I remember my, my parents telling me, um, you know, be careful what you watch. You, you can't unsee something. And I didn't really understand what they meant. And so there's this big argument going on in the world about how you know these horror horror uh, films and how these RPG games and these computer games how they could possibly corrupt the youth, and uh, so that was a big thing. Uh, but for us as kids, um, every VHS just kind of seemed like a mystery to explore, it's just a new adventure. 
And that's the way that we saw it. Grab a drink of water. And that's how all this stuff is described in the, in the book, Tales from the Lou. Uh, they tell you all these, these really awesome details that, that really suck you back into this world super quick and, and brought up all these memories that I didn't, that I had forgot about, you know, and so it just brings you right back in. So if nothing else, just read it for the Lord. It's incredible. So then, so, and it keeps going with this and it, and it talks about the, I should have been flipping through my book some, you know, sorry about that, but um, it talks about, you know, the, the kids growing up going sledding and the VHS tapes, child's play. Yeah. Child's play. Thank you, Misty. Thank you. And then there was a sequel. I think it was called uh, bride of Chucky or something like that. But yeah, child's play is what it was. Good job. Good job. You get a, you get a star sticker or something, Misty. Um, Jay goes, I remember recording things on VHS LP mode. Yeah. Where you could put nine hours of movie on a single tape, but the quality was really noisy and grainy. Yeah. I remember that you had LP and SP, the different modes allowed you to record less or more on a tape, but the quality got worse. So, um, but yeah, there, there's so much awesome stuff in this book and they go through, here's the map of, of, uh, Sweden. Here's where it talks about the loop, which is the, the one of the pictures that are on the cover. And it walks you through Sweden, these different places in Sweden, the Bona Towers, the defense research facility. And it talks about each one separately. So I've kind of gone through what it's like growing up and the things to do in the 80s. And then it walks you through the city and it talks about the different factories there and all these different places where you know, the schools are and where the stores are and where um, it seems like there's some, some weird stuff going on at this research facility over here. Um, let's see. So yeah, it's, it's just got all this, all this really great stuff. It talks about the, the company that, that funded the loop and it's called Rick Synergy or something like that. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to pronounce that. Rick Synergy. Uh, sounds good to me. But, uh, and it tells you about this company. And so it really gets you into this, um, into this world very quickly and very deeply. So then it talks about the civilian and military technology uh, back in this time. What's up, Sean? And so back in 1943, like I was telling you in this book, the magnetrine effect was discovered, and um, which uses the Earth's magnetic fields to provide lift, but mostly in the northern hemisphere because the magnetic field is stronger. Um, now, uh, the traditional shipping is still used in this world, and it is um, because of the, the limitations of the magnetrine effect. Uh, so you still have boats, and, and train is still faster. And so there, there's still cars and trucks and those type of things. Just you have addition to that. You have these giant freighters that uh, can travel long distances with very uh, low amounts of fuel carrying enormous uh, tonnage, like 10,000 plus tons. And uh, they do this off the ground by using this magnetrine effect in this world. And But these magnets... Um, this magnetic fields that these uh, devices give off, they can actually disrupt electronics and, and power grids and power lines. So the routes are of these, these freighters are very highly regulated you know, to mostly non-populated areas. But some of the smaller ships can actually go uh, over land, over some, some kind of remote places. So it kind of talks about that. And then as, as far as military technology goes, you know, there's uh, military they came out with military um, vehicles that are, use this magnetrine effect. And they would, um, they tried armored vehicles, of course, one of the very first things they did. But um, the book says that they proved too heavy uh, for most uses, which I found strange because if you can lift, you know, 10,000 tons with this thing, it seems like armor wouldn't be that bad. Maybe it was a speed to, you know, ratio or something like that. But they said that what they did use them for a lot was for uh, carrying troops and for cargo uh, because they aren't limited to any type of terrain and uh, they can make good use of the technology that way. So I thought that was neat. Now, as far as the robots that they said were, were um, invented by the Japanese, what do they call them? Self-balancing machines, which we call robots. They use them in, um, in, in industry 
you know, um, maybe carrying, even like you might see them at the grocery store, carrying groceries or, or stocking shelves, something like that, or in warehouses working, uh, to doing all types of military work, like, you know, guarding and, and things like that, uh, even fighting some, some wars and stuff like that. But that's most of the time they were, a lot of times they were remote controlled using, you know, satellite uplinks from a command center. And then also some of them were self-controlled or even controlled by uh, line of sight. And they called it um, like a glove, a glove control. And that made me think back, what was the glove that we used back? It was a Nintendo glove and you put it over your hand and had these little sensors on it. Man, I got to look that up. And uh, it, it rarely worked, but you had the glove, then you had the little mat as well that you'd run on and it really sucked it, it really never worked but i remember having one of those but that's what that reminded me of people will, will control these robots some of the robots via line of sight with these type of gloves and so anyway so there's 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 tons and tons more information about uh about the world back in the 1980s in the book tales from the loop and i just don't have time to cover it i could be going on and on and on for hours uh, but the, just just reading through it sucks you right into the 1980s. And the time that they spent to develop all the aspects from the political climate to the individual lives to growing up back in the 19, 1980s, the technology, um, how it works, its discovery, um, it, they really just spent a whole lot of time explaining this world to us all. And they did a power glove. Yes, power glove, Sean. That was it. But they did a really good job sucking us into this world. Uh, and I, how many times can I say sucking us into this world in the 1980s? But that's exactly what they do. You can't get out. Like these memories just come flooding back. And they spent all this time doing it, writing this uh, this this great lore, mixing history, uh, the real history with the twisted, their own little twist on history, alternate history that, that the lines of, of real and imagination just seem to blur. Because I can't remember like, you know, what was going on at, at that time? Didn't, you know, was this real or was it not real? Was that part of the book or is that really what happened? And I think that's a lot of where the magic takes place in this RPG because you, you end up, those lines blur so much that you stop caring and, and it overlaps with your real memories and helps you develop, uh, get into this world and develop new memories of it uh, very easily. So yeah, you just start reading it and you, and you can't stop in this book. So anyway, that's about it for, for the Tales from the Loop in, in the world. Like I said, it goes on. Um, let me show you some of this awesome art because it, it is definitely worth seeing. Um, it even has a thing here about how the magnetrine, magnetrine flight, how it works. It breaks it down, and it's kind of neat. Uh, then it goes through, just like how, how it went through the Swedish loop, it goes through the United States loop as well, which is in Boulder City, Nevada. And it kind of goes through what it's like growing up in America, just like how we went through growing up in, in Sweden. And, um, you know, it talks about the things to do in the eighties when you're hanging out at the pool and playing games and watching music videos. I forgot about that. Man, MTV came out in 1980s, right? Friday night videos. Yeah. Friday night videos. That's pretty epic. So, um, Let's see. What do they have here? Oh, and it goes through like you know, the the salvage place there, the theater, the Boulder Dam Hotel, the airport. It just kind of goes through all these different areas, and it tells you a little bit about them. That way, when you're creating the scenes for your game, that you'll have some details already filled in about uh, where things are located uh, in relation to one another, and a little bit of detail to help get you kickstarted on on what's around and let you helps you set the scene when you start going to different places. I just thought that was fantastic. Look at this giant robot. That's just badass. I don't know if this dude down here is kind of, um, if you look real close, he's got like an, he's holding something with an antenna. I wonder if that's one of those cool power glove things. I don't know. But um, yeah, that's going to be about it tonight. Next time I'm going to be going over uh, the character creation. Let me see here. Yeah. Going to be going over the character creation and Tales from the Loop. If you got any questions, go ahead and ask them, and I'll try to answer them before I get off. If not, just throw them down in the comments, and I'll I'll get to them after the stream's over. But uh, yeah, I'm going to be going over Tales, uh, Tales from the Loop character creation. How do you create a character? What are all the different types of characters that you can play in this world? 
Uh, if I have time, I'll probably go over some of the mechanics. Some of them are really unique and really cool, um, similar to kids on bikes that I thought were, were super cool that stuck out to me. And uh, they do some, some really neat things in Tales from the Loop as well. And so I'm going to go over some of those, how dice rolls work, along with suffering conditions and what, you know, what happens when you, when you fail a roll as well. So I'm going to be going over that. Um, I might, I might try to bust it up and do it early and do it tomorrow because there's so much in this book. I'm going to try. We'll just see how the day goes. If not, if I don't do it tomorrow on Thursday, then I'll, I'll definitely be doing it on Friday. Well, that's about it for me tonight. Uh, Joe says, can I say that you're very articulate and present these videos in a concise and entertaining manner. You walk us through with much interest. Well, thank you, Joe. Hey, somebody give Joe a, a star or a, a heart or something or a beer or whatever he wants. Pay the man for the compliment. Pay the man. Anyway, that's it for me tonight. Thank you so much for tuning in. And we'll be back tomorrow night with either some more Tales from a Loop. We might play some magic. Who knows?